still allow semi-automatic weapons to be purchased is sick. It's just sick. It has no, no social redeeming value. Zero. None. Not a single solitary rationale for it except profit for the gun manufacturer. Can you do anything about gun laws during the lame duck, sir? I'm going to try. What will you find to... I'm going to try to get rid of assault weapons. President Biden on Thanksgiving Day addressing a wave of mass shootings over the past week, promising to go back to Congress and push for additional gun reform. But that's a tall order with the GOP-controlled House he'll face in January. Let's dig into that and more with our roundtable, former DNC chair and ABC contributor Donna Brazil, form, uh, former Justice Department spokesperson and contributor Sarah Isger, ABC political director Rick Klein, and Washington Post live anchor Leanne Caldwell, welcome to all of you this morning. And Donna, I want to start with you on these mass shootings. It's been a terrible year, a terrible month, a terrible week. You just heard Biden say he wants to have an assault weapons ban. Is there really any chance for that? You know, I think it's going to be tough, uh, not only because of the makeup of the Congress, but also because we know that uh, on the Republican side, they lack the political will. Uh, while Senator, uh, Senator uh, Chris Murphy was able to get bipartisan support with the Safer Communities Act, stopping gun violence is going to be more than just a political act. I think it's going to be a societal <clears throat> moral issue. Over 39,000 people have lost their lives. 39,600 mass shooting along this month. If we don't begin to put our entire society behind stopping gun violence, stopping violence, period, I'm afraid it's going to get even worse. And, and Sarah, is there any political support with Republicans? We've heard this. We know this. We've known this for so long. Yeah, and I think that when you're looking at something like the assault weapons ban, no, I don't think there's a lot of future for that. Where I think Republicans would be willing to come to the table is on beefing up a lot of the enforcement on the laws that we already have that we're not enforcing. You put a lot more money in police and prosecutors to take illegal guns off the street. I think Republicans will come to the table on something like that. The problem is that it's so much more politically fun and palatable to talk about some new gun law you're going to pass. But if you don't put the money behind enforcing it, we've got tons of gun laws. We're not doing a whole lot with them. And, and Leanne, there have been a lot of accusations. There are a lot of reasons these things happen. Mm -hmm. But people are pointing to hate, spe hate speech and yes. political rhetoric being a motivation in some way. I think that what has been proven is that the gun violence issue is multifaceted. It's not just about guns. It's also about hate hate speech. It's also about mental health. It's about social media. Um, and so it's become a problem that has been almost impossible for Congress to solve. As Donna mentioned, Congress passed the most expansive uh, gun control legislation in two decades earlier this summer. We are still having mass shootings. The House of Representatives did pass an assault weapons ban in the past year. Uh, the chances of it passing in the Senate is very slim in the next, in the ne or impossible in the next uh, few weeks before the Congress ends. Um, but it might be an issue that is much bigger than Congress can solve. And, and Rick, when you, when you look at the polls and ABC polls, voters largely support gun control measures, 56 to 40 in the latest poll. But when you drill down on that, it's, it's really largely Democrats. Yeah, and look, and you see it even playing out in the elections earlier this month, where you, you had new initiatives in Oregon and Iowa going in opposite directions on gun control, at the, really on the, on the same day. I do think the action in the states is, is, is going to be more significant, ultimately, even though, as Sarah said, you're not going to be able to legislate this away entirely. There is still a window of opportunity for states to take some kind of an action. A lot of the failings that we've seen in in Colorado, Virginia, have been about state laws that may or may not have been fully enforced. I think that's where you're going to see more movement. I think President Biden knows the math on this, and he'd like to see it happen, but there's a lot that has to happen in the next couple of weeks, and this is not going to likely be part of it. And, and Leanne, I want to go back to you because the assault weapons ban he's trying for, but what else is President Biden going for in Congress, and the Democrats in particular, trying to get done in this lame duck session? In the lame duck session, I mean, putting guns aside, 
um, you have a whole list of things that they're trying to do. You have to pass government funding that expires December 16th or the government shuts down. They want to do a more permanent lifting of the debt limit so that the country can pay its credit card bills. Um, and then you also have the national defense bill that has passed, been passed every year for 60 years that they're also trying to pass. And those are the must-do things. And then there are the things that might arise, too, like this rail strike uh, that Congress might have to intervene in. And then there's the Electoral Count Act that they also want to pass to make sure January 6, 2021 doesn't happen again. And, and Donna, I want to take that rail strike to you. That, that is looming large and could have a huge effect. What are they doing about it? Well, first of all, the president said the other day that they're in the middle of negotiations. And I think this is one area where, once again, President Biden has shown that he understands how to bring both parties together. The unions who are really hell-bent on making sure that their workers can get some paid uh, sick leave. Uh, and, of course, the, the big companies, the real companies are saying, look, if we slow this down, if this doesn't happen, we're going to pay a, a hell of a price because of what we see on our rail tracks every day. I want to also say, in addition to uh, the rail strike, I mean, we got 20 judicial vacancies. Let's hope that the Senate will act on those vacancies and move them. Respect for Marriage Act. We saw Republicans uh, in the House, at least 40-some, uh, seven, uh, support that when it came through the House. Senator Collins and Senator uh, Tammy Baldwin have really come up with a good plan. That's another area. So I think that this is going to be probably one of the busiest lame duck sessions we've seen in a long time. It, it sure is. But one thing we have seen, Sarah, is the student loan forgiveness program paused once again. This really has been kind of a mess for the administration, but is standing in the way of relieving debt for 40 million Americans a great strategy for Republicans? At this point, I think a big problem for the administration is that this midterm election was in some ways the worst outcome for Joe Biden. <laughs> he doesn't have a mandate on his legislative uh, agenda. And on the other hand, he also doesn't have a mandate to redraw the Democratic Party in his own image. And so, sure, the lame duck has three weeks to get all of these things done. OK, but after that, you're going to have a president instead of, and it's not just Joe Biden, this has been going on for 10, 15 years now, instead of pursuing a compromise legislative agenda that could get through Congress, acting alone, doing executive orders that then get stalled in court. The student load program at this point, it's not even looking like it could get resolved before the summer right now. That's no way to run a railroad, and it's no way to run a presidency. And, and, and Rick, you can respond to that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but how big of a hit for the administration is, is it without this student loan program? I think they're very, the White House is very glad that we're on the other side of the midterms to have to deal with this. Uh, they saw the pretty strong turnout for Democrats among, among younger voters in particular. I think where this begins to matter uh, politically is that we're in a stage still where people are trying to figure out on the Democratic side, is the Biden presidency a resounding success or is it kind of a middling thing or is it a major disappointment? And you've got voices on the left. It depends on who you ask over <laughs> this, this side this of the This today's table. panel may yeah. have some thoughts yeah. on it. But look, it, it, there's, there's an argument to be made about how productive this, this Congress has been and how productive Biden has been and what he's been able to do. There's also a case you made about uh, promises unkept and liberal fantasies and dreams that are, that are unmet. And this is going to bleed into the 2024 conversation because President Biden, of course, has not made an actual announcement as whether he's going to run or not. It doesn't appear like there's likely to be major primary challengers to him, but people are still deciding on the Democratic side, was this election a validation or vindication or, or not? And what does it mean for the, for the president's prospects going forward? So you have a, a stalled action item like this, a promise that was not delivered. It's, it's harmful. So, so does he turn to executive orders like Trump and Obama? I think so. He's already used executive orders, as we mentioned, on the student loans. I think that that's go the next two years is going to be pure gridlock. We are going to see very little legislation coming through Congress with a Republican House and a Democratic Senate. And so the president's only option at this point is executive orders. Now, the last two administrations have used them in a much greater capacity than previous administrations. We'll see if he continues on that track. But if he wants to try to deliver for the American people ahead of 2020, especially if he's running again, he's going to have to do that. And, and Full Employment Act for lawyers when <laughs> administrations do that. I mean, the number of nationwide injunctions increased hugely in the Obama administration, even more in the Trump administration. We're seeing it again now. He does have an opportunity. Work with the Congress you have, not the Congress you want. Well, Stop trying to fulfill every wish I mean, list. You, you talk about a Republican caucus that has a split personality. <laughs> one, one side of it wants to just investigate, retaliate, and just practice the politics of revenge. And the other side, I think, what some of the 
Republicans who won in so-called Biden districts, yeah. they may decide that they want to work with this administration. Let's see what will happen. Okay. Let's go back to Donald Trump. You brought it up. He's <laughs> running again. <laughs> but his legal problems really did get worse this week with the Supreme Court ordering that he turn over his tax returns. DOJ just appointed the special counsel. What is he doing in all this? He had the early announcement. Did yeah. he get a bump? Yeah, in addition to a bad dinner uh, in, in the last couple yeah, of days. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to bring that up. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I, think, I think there was an argument in Trump world that said get ahead of everyone else in the field, try to scare out some of the other candidates, and try to force the Justice Department into an awkward position where, um, where they can't really prosecute someone who's a candidate. Now, I think both of those things may have backfired. One, with the special counsel announcements, uh, that means you've got someone who's a bulldog going to go after the, the, the president and, and find if there's, if there's something there. And the other thing, it's clear now that he's not going to have this primary field to himself. You've seen from Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley on down, Mike Pompeo, people that worked for him, were loyal to him, saying they are in regardless of whether Donald Trump is in. And frankly, the events of the last couple of weeks between the legal challenges and some ill-advised political moves have only fueled their determination and made it more obvious to the Republican base that, yeah, whether or not you think he's going to fall for any of these legal issues, he is just a flawed individual. And, and speaking of ill-advised moves, uh, Don, I'm going to turn to you on this, the dinner with... Uh formerly known as Kanye West, now Ye, and Nicholas Fuentes, or an extremist right-wing commentator you know when that, you, when, that Donald Trump had dinner with. You know when you go into a hotel, the first thing I look for is that privacy uh, little door hanger. Like, <laughs> what has his privacy door hanger? I mean, who vetted <laughs> these two individuals? <laughs> uh, uh, open bigot, uh, uh, an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denial dinner? Seriously? I mean, I would give him a gift card to McDonald's uh, to avoid that type of uh, uh, commitment uh, in dinner. I want to quote my colleague, Chris Christie, and he said, this is just awful, unacceptable conduct from anyone, but most from a former president and current candidate. That says it all. And, and Trump's awful. former ambassador to Israel. So how David did Friedman. this happen, and do you buy the excuse, hey, I, I didn't even know this Fuentes guy? Oh, please. No, we're sort of over those type of uh, statements. I think that Donald Trump, it's interesting. He's showing himself as a more flawed candidate here in the run-up to 2024 than we saw, frankly, in 2016 or 2020. And you have a lot of Republican voters who like Donald Trump who are realizing he cannot win in 2024. And I think there'll be a real shopping period in the Republican primary. What's interesting to me is do we have this as sort of a 2016 cattle call where everyone's fighting with each other to get that one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump? We know how that turned out. Or is this more like 2008 where the narrative is constantly around Trump versus DeSantis and no one else can kind of get their balloon back up in the air? I want to take that to you, Leanne. Yeah, I think that kind of echoing what Rick said, the investigations have shown that there is a weakness with Trump, even though his supporters might dismiss him as political witch hunts. But polls have shown that a majority of people, up to 58 percent, want the investigations to continue. Yes, most of those are Democrats. But what I noticed, there's 20 to 22 percent of Republicans who also think the same. And so you're seeing a softening of support of Donald Trump. And that's why these Republicans challengers are willing to perhaps challenge him in 2024. And Chris Christie, perhaps maybe he's going to be another one, too. List. The worst I'm moment missing. for Donald Trump this week was not at the Supreme Court where they told him to turn over his tax returns. It was not the DOJ special counsel. It was that 11th Circuit hearing over the Mar-a-Lago classified yes. documents. Those were three Republican-appointed judges, two Trump-appointed judges, and it could not have gone worse for that Trump legal team. They were being asked nearly embarrassing-level questions of how many different ways they're going to lose that. And, and where do you see that going? It means that the DOJ investigation into those classified documents is about to get a turbo boost because it's no longer going to be delayed in that Florida special counsel separate lawsuit. Nobody better explaining these things than you, Sarah, but I, <laughs> I, I want to turn to the other guy. President Biden yes. said this week or this weekend in Nantucket that he was really thinking about whether he would run or not. I think we have about 30 seconds here, Donna. He's bought time to make up his mind, but at some point... Uh, this weekend, Gavin Newsom 
pledged his support to Joe Biden. But I still, I still believe it's an open question of whether or not he will decide to run. If he chooses he, to he run, he said in the I past, will... "I'm going to run." I well, think, but now we all, he's thinking we about it. We always say that before an election. The election is now over. Now he has to decide if he's ready for two more grueling years of campaigning and governing at the same time. And they will be grueling indeed. And Absolutely. you guys will be tracking it all the <laughs> way. Thanks so much for coming in on a holiday weekend. Thanks, Great to see you all.